Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cast Track. We post an interview with an amazing Canadian each weekday for your daily inspiration. Today, I would like to introduce you to my friend, Heather Christie Burns. Heather was born here in Calgary at the Grace Hospital. She's happily married to her husband of 21 years, and they have 11-year-old twin boys. Heather feels very blessed to have them to support her as she does for them. So nice. Besides Heather's family, she is very passionate about learning and working with others to create an, and implement new solutions in the energy industry. She enjoys breaking a challenge down into its parts and forming a creative approach. Even when times are difficult, Heather is a believer in human good and wants to bring out the best in herself and others. She also loves being outdoors in the mountains or forest, the look of a canola field in the summer. Oh, I love that too. A good laugh with friends, and she tells me that she always has a really good stack of great books next to her nightstand. Friends, you will find her full bio attached. Heather, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, good morning, Catherine. It's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be included in a list of incredible people and the conversations you've been having have been really valuable. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Heather. Are you ready for the questions that we sent your way? I am as ready as I'm going to be. So yes. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so the first one being, what's been your greatest challenge in the last few months? Yeah, I've, I've been going, uh, it's been a longer journey for me, other than the, the big cliff we all experienced in March with COVID. So um, for me to explain or to give a little context, uh, the what I was doing for approximately 15 years changed in uh, July, about just about a year ago uh, to date where the company I was uh, running, it was a little upstream oil and gas company, and uh, we were sold at that time. And understanding that the go forward picture was, was pretty murky for that model and for further investment. We had American owners, and we could not produce a viable investment thesis to continue to, to grow and you know, perpetuate that. So really what I was busy doing up until uh, you know, COVID hit, which continued through that was, important things to me was I had a team of people that I worked with and respected highly for many years was thinking about um, employment. So the big, the biggest challenge for me um, with all of them, not just my, myself as well, is like, what do you do next and where do you fit and how do you actually add value? Fundamentally, you know, we have the basic needs. We all have to meet with an income, but beyond that, you know, in, in Calgary, generally, we've been pretty blessed with being able to work a lot of the time at what I call the top of the Maslow pyramid. So that's that area of feeling of worth and self-actualization and employment and good employment is a big piece of that. So the biggest thing I was really struggling with in the last few months was what I did the last 15 years was ultimately start ventures. And I was, I was grateful to have the opportunity to do that, the capital partners to work with to do that, the teams of people and, and create good employment and create opportunities in the communities we worked in. And you could see the impact of it, right? So the argument was always, you look at little oil and gas and it's, why do you need to exist? <laughs> Which has always been a very interesting debate and conversation at the best of times. But the idea of moving into gaps and niches where large operators or really large companies would not see the opportunity in the same way or invest the dollars or pursue something of higher risk potentially. Mm -hmm. So that's something I've always enjoyed doing was looking for the gaps and trying to find out how do you fit and what's missing and then ultimately that, that pride, I guess, of creating opportunity for, for others, not just me um, or my family, but to, to multiply it. So seeing the impact you had, like I remember writing a letter, you know, I'm not a big letter writer, but back when I was in a public company, Angle Energy was the first company um, I started with a partner in early 2000s, and it was a roller coaster ride of everything. And uh, thinking about how many people did we actually employ? And it went beyond the office, you know, or the field. Like we yeah. had at, at peak, we were probably about 75 people direct. But when you looked at the second and third order jobs and, and engagement of, of an entity like that, which was really small and didn't pay taxes and didn't matter in all those bigger ways, uh, it was significant. Like when we calculated it, we were probably, you know, four to 500 jobs at any given time when well, we looked at that, right? So yeah. that was a big thing. So I, I think about it now, Catherine, and, and I'm still really passionate about that. And I want to... I want to be a vector for something positive and and help do that and create something that adds value so well you've always done that heather and i remember you at angle you that was a great success story and you had a great team there yeah we were very fortunate and uh man did i ever learn a lot like one of the things that 
<laughs> I tell friends of mine and everyone is that I think, you know, one of the powers of being in, in your, um, maybe in your early 30s, when I started that company, I was 31 with, uh, with my partner who was much more experienced than I was in the industry. Um, you learn a lot and you, the power of not knowing, uh, basically you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So anything's possible. <laughs> Whereas you go forward and you acquire experience, you go through things. Um, the battle when you get to be, and I'm, I'm not ancient yet, although some days I feel like it when I talk to my kids. I'm in my late 40s now and I think, wow, um, you know, how much I didn't know then that even if someone told me, I don't know that I would have lived it that way. And that you have to fight your baggage, right? So don't lose sight of even if something in the past didn't work or it failed to really look at the conditions of why that was and to continue to be, you know, not just hopeful practically, but to reinvestigate things that might be that the time is now, right? So, so what I learned is a lot of things are timing and timing is frustrating because we don't control it and we don't predict it. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's been the big thing for me in the last, um, the last few months is really, I've never been a very patient person <laughs> and I've really had to work on developing like that, that attribute, like thinking about when do you just stop trying to churn and when do you, when do you calm down and say, okay, I need to back up and I need to revisit. And the discipline of that has been, has been a really good source of grounding. So the idea of thinking about, um, you have to have a vision of the future and you also have to accept that you need to rebuild it constantly. Yeah, you're right. And I'm the same. I lack patience all over the place. <laughs> That's one of your great powers though too, Catherine. Because oh. <laughs> you, you get things, it goes back to the balance, the balance between thinking and action, right? And, and you've always been able to, in my opinion, you ride that balance very effectively. So. Oh, thank you, Heather. That's so nice. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so that's and, the answer to your first question. <laughs> thank you. And what are the three things that you'd like to share with us today? So coming up with only three things <laughs> and doing it in an organized <laughs> manner was one of the great challenges of taking some notes over the last few days, thinking about this conversation I was going to have with you. And, and I, I read and I listen and I've had space to do that because now I'm in this funny bucket of I'm not in my formal, you know, whatever it looked like 60 hours a week scenario. And, and many people are still in that scenario trying to work from home. So I have a couple of directorships right now and I'm, I'm grateful for that. This perspective I've had from it's been great. I'm a director at the University of Calgary and learning a lot about the post-secondary world, um, goods, bads, areas you can control and what you can't. Um, and the team there is incredible. I can say that. So that's a, it's a shining light in the community. Nice. And, uh, that's been neat. And I'm also a director at a little um, a startup called Interface Fluidics. And they're one of the great success stories in town in that they had originally come out of the Creative Destruction Lab program at the UC a few years ago. And then they were one of the first graduates in 2018 of an accelerator between Techstars. That's a big venture capital group in the U.S. and Equinor. Equinor has a venture fund. So, um, you know, the big... Uh, petroleum producer who we, we, we love to, you know, look at, study, and then compete with somewhat, I think, in, in the Canadian um, oil and gas space. So they're a very good one to watch. And so they're backed by these two groups. And I've been learning a lot watching this team, um, young team, bright, um, really neat technology they're pursuing. And I think I gain as much, I know I gain as much, if not more, from them and the involvement in the business than they, they do from me and the things I can tell them. So these exchanges I've been involved in, I've been really grateful for. So I think the first thing is, you know, being open to those opportunities um, and how they look. And, and funnily enough, it, it, it transcends, you know, what is this work? Uh, so this stuff I'm doing, basically, and I've also been working as a mentor in a technology accelerator called Zone Startups. And seeing the companies there and just trying to, you know, that next leg up to help them achieve. The idea of being outside yourself and what's worrying you and translating that to, to how can I help other people um, has been the, the greatest thing. I think that idea of as much as you can, we all have our realities and, and I accept that we've been, my husband and I are, are pretty fortunate with our boys. Um, you know, we're not, we're not uber wealthy, but we're not losing our house or something along those lines, right? So there's a balance in when you're giving people advice, also understanding where are they yeah. and, and that ability to, to go forward, what can you do? So I have a very relative luxury of being able to do things where we're stable right now. Um, like we're okay. So okay. that's really, that's really good. Um, and one of my goals is ultimately to build back some wealth. I had a lot of money into my last firm, which, you know, 
we all know these things have not, you know, the asset value has never materialized. So I want to build back up um, an ability to invest more into some of these companies and the entities starting up and support the entrepreneurs, like support the groups trying to build something. So that's a, that's a goal I have. Okay. So that's kind of one of the first things is thinking about trying to do as much as you can get out of your own head, your own self, your own problems and what you thought you once were. So I think one of the things I see is this issue of identity and value. Mm-hmm. And I've thought a lot in my own community where uh, what I mean by that is uh, specifically experienced in the oil and gas industry in upstream, particularly at one point in time, I actually stopped attending some of the social events mm-hmm. because I found that the conversations were not new and they were not encouraging. Right. And I thought, you know, we, we need to acknowledge that it's not um, there's trouble and it's difficult and it's hurting people. And to brush that by or to try to positive talk over that is not the goal. But we also need to think about um, our conversations and what can we do to be additive there, right? So I thought really hard about that. I thought, okay, this is a way to get myself out of my head and what I can do to be productive. So that was one of the first things I wanted to to talk to people about. Um, A framework for that that I found kind of useful was, um, you know, I consume more than I should. And that's that's going to be my point number two of books and seminars and things that you can learn and it is overwhelming the amount of knowledge and information and people to listen to you and talk to you out there is incredible so so you're you're sort of you're alone but you're not alone is one thing but i remember looking at in my notes here i have a couple of points to keep it sort of in an organized way about mind traps and especially for people who are leaders or running a business or or you're thinking people are looking up to you for the answers no matter what role that is, whether it's just in your family or whether it's in any other professional engagement or, or your friends. But if people are looking to you, um, number one, it's too much to process, right? So what we've been going through in the absolute flood of news and information and trend and everything coming at us and health, you know, advice even, um, just what are you consuming and why? Um, so I think it's it's a really important thing to think about. It's like, it's like your diet. It's like food, water, sleep, basic stuff. Um, the information media and conversations you have is what you are putting in your brain. So thinking about what you're consuming and thinking about that, you know, very carefully is, is been something I've done a lot in the last, certainly in the last few years and thinking about, you know, if I have an opinion or a view, how have I formed that? What experience do I have to hold it? And what have I not looked at? Where am I wrong? <laughs> so the older I get, the more wrong I realize that I can be. <laughs> I was, I, was super, I was super brilliant in my 20s and I was oh, yeah. pretty smart in my 30s and now in my late 40s I'm like yeah okay <laughs> so uh, so that part you know the ability to be intellectually humble is really really important I mean we all have opinions but look at what you consume and why mm-hmm. and how does that form what you think that's mind trap number one um, the second one is perceived loss of control and the place I'll go with that one is um, which is interesting to think about is you know, we, we look at, well, we don't know what's going to happen and I don't know what I can do about it, obviously. So these are real things, but I love this quote was, uh, to the world, you may be one person, but to one person, you may be the world. Oh, wow. Whenever I, I think about that, I think about this and, and it's, um, it's daunting in one way, but also calming is that you're this role model. And I have these boys, I have these 11 year old, wonderful boys that humble me in so many ways, teach me too. And I look at it and think, well, if I was just to roll up in a ball and say, I can't deal with this, what lessons am I teaching? You know, even if you have to strip it all back down to nothing and build it back up, um, you know, is that example to your kids of learning new and, and resilience and, you know, not being at the high points that maybe you once were in your career and what do you do about that is um, really important because you're modeling that for them. You're modeling how do you respond and being adaptable and resilient and, and all of that is really important. So I always think about what am I showing them? You know, how do I show up? So that's a big one for me too, is that idea of uh, how do we deal with the perceived loss of control? Is it we actually have a lot of agency and we directly affect those around us. Mm-hmm. So that's important. And then one of the last ones was the sphere of the unknown, <laughs> which is dominating everything now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and it's not, again, it's not to be brushed by, it's quite serious, but you know, it's this ongoing mental stress without resolution because we will not know, like until things unfold, um, you can't know. You can come up with visions of the future, which I think we all need to build and then say, how do I prepare? But understand that those plans need to always be revisited. But the other backside of this, the flip of the coin to me is that 
we're wired also though. Like, so the unknown is scary. However, humans, how we even sustain ourselves all this time is that our brain is wired to explore and figure things out and unveil something new. So the idea of flipping the great unknown on its head and trading out fear for opportunities to investigate, research and innovate. Mm -hmm. So what, what do we do? So the idea of acknowledging where we are and the hard truths of some of that and the difficulties of some of that, and it's not where we wanted to be, but we acknowledge that and say, now what? Yeah. Now, what do you do? So those are areas that I, I thought grounded me really well. And just in terms of, of leaders, it was an interesting thing to think about that humans are driven to accept negative consequences now over unknown futures. I like that one. Wow. And that can sabotage your long-term plans. Yeah. So. Wow, I love that. Words of wisdom, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, half of the job is the things you consume is to curate it. Mm -hmm. so Find out of the things you read, the people you talk to, what really resonated with you? When you had that conversation with somebody, how'd you feel? Yeah. And I think that's always a neat takeaway for me is uh, my goal in any meeting I have is I know that anyone I talk to, I'm going to learn from. Yeah. And when I leave that thing feeling energized, I'm like, wow, I mean, that was so valuable. So my goal is to give someone back the same, you know, any interaction I have is to do that. And I to do it that. in a way that's not fake, right? So this isn't just a buttering people up or being like, well, you shouldn't worry about that and don't worry, your family's fine. I mean, it's, it's an acknowledgement of where people are at as yeah, well. Yeah, I agree. That critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah, if that's I, if I can teach my kids anything, that's the skill. Honestly. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well done. Yeah. Excellent. And the next part, anything else you'd like to share there? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> thinking about all this, uh, you know, great framework and, and cohesion is this, this company that, um, you know, I'm helping right now with their journey interface and the things that they're up to. It, it is quite neat. I mean, there's obviously been a lot of bumps in the road for everybody, but um, is this idea of, of one of the things the CEO said to me on a call last week. And he said, um, we just want to sit down and understand how we make decisions, like come up with a workable framework to make decisions. Love it. One thing that we can't come up with, um, you think that we're going to have a strategy session in August. So we're preparing for that with the board. We're going through this right now. And the idea of going forward and you think, well, you're not going to know, and you're not, you're trying to come up with things like sales projections and new markets and what's going to happen with this. And you need to make those efforts for sure. And this goes back to even my last business. One of the things I talked with my team about at my last company, and it was a long, it was like watching a train station coming from a long way away. I knew that unless the market shifted and I knew it for almost two years with wow. the business, that we weren't going to come out with what you would consider a normal win. Wow. So one of the things we did is, you know, I, I went through the process of reframing, you know, your thoughts on success. So we can't, we can't control, um, you know, circumstances necessarily, we'll do our best, but we can control our narratives mm -hmm. and the perceptions of that, right? So I think going forward and even just looking at this city and looking at what are we doing, you know, all collectively is we are in control of the stories we tell. Yeah. Right. So what's, what stories do we want to tell? And I mean, and also the other thing about um, going forward and thinking about consuming all of this and all this, you know, right thought and right orientation and, and right, we also need to think about translating it into action. Mm -hmm. So one of the places I don't want people to get stuck either, myself included, is the endless loop of, you know, analysis and thought and all of this matters. But then think about, am I putting out um, actions that are consistent with what I'm taking in? And what am I doing about that? So I think this idea of action, and this is one that we talk about this at the university too going forward. And so what we've been able to do, and right now, you know, I had this chat with my dad the other day. Right now, it feels like the only money showing up anywhere is from the government, which was ultimately all of ours anyway, right? So everything's yeah. sort of, because of where we're at, it's being government financed, or people are, you know, trying to support their businesses with wage subsidies, or we're all in this odd recycling of all of this money being channeled back through the government into things. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from there, right? So you just look at this unraveling of that and say, okay, so we are taking government money right now, and we are turning dollars into ideas. And some of the ideas are really great and that's awesome. And I'm seeing a ton of that, but the next step, which is a lot harder is taking those ideas and turning the ideas into the dollars mm -hmm. and, that, and then back to the investment into, into Calgary, into our province, into Alberta. What do we do that? And, and how do we do that? So that's the big, I think that's the big thing going forward. 
And a couple of thoughts, you know, on that side to look at. I like to watch where investments are being made yeah. and why and come up with that thesis. And I think watching, watching the actions of the investors is an important area to think about when you're looking at your strategy and your business. And so on that note, I'm looking at the startups and obviously if you're just looking at employment and the whole in Calgary and the whole in Alberta, the startups, and it's unfair to do this to them, the entrepreneurs are not going to fill that job hole. Like that is not, that is not the thing, right? So even though there's going to be job creation, like, you know, Interface itself at one point had 35 people for a startup and a lab active in Edmonton, which is amazing. So yes, there's jobs that are created from startups, but I think more importantly, it's going to be the marriage between the new and the old. And yeah. um, it's the what is, right? And trying to connect the technologies back into, you know, some of our larger corporates, some of the bigger players where we can bridge things and then really see growth and investment and do it globally. Mm -hmm. So you know, examples I would give on that. Um, so Enbridge's recent, um, you know, which is a behemoth, a large significant company um, is moving into walking through how do we think about energy going forward? And they've made significant investments looking at European gas. This theme is repeating. So watch for themes, watch for repetition, watch for what, is, what do you think it means? Come up with why does this make sense? And the other thing that recently happened was the Chevron purchase of Noble Energy in the US. Yeah, I try. This is beyond just a simple consolidation story where it's like, well, things are you know down and they're cheap and this is why they're just buying cheap barrels. Noble was part of an interesting project, not without hair and issue, offshore Israel. So right. this is something called the Leviathan gas field. That is significant. So that gas field and what's going on with it in Europe and the positioning there um, is going to be something that that was key for Chevron looking at the new setup for energy and how do we now change our portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I think watching these things, if you're here and understanding how do we legitimately participate because that's how we're going to add jobs. That's how we're going to look at investment. ACO Energy's recent announcement of their work with Emissions Reduction Alberta and the hydrogen facility that Very started good. is also interesting. Very. The hard part is not losing heart because these technological moves are long in their implementation. Like these are things that are decades yeah. and we need to work along and find little milestones where we can feel that we progress, right? So that's also important because the patience is difficult when people throw their hands up and say, oh, well, we tried this thing and it didn't turn out to solve everything. Like when you look at these, these technologies, these solutions, the challenge is it does not fill the immediate hole of the jobs we've lost in things like the EPCMs, the engineering mm -hmm. firms that worked on the mega oil sands projects that filled the office towers, right? And we've got 50 issues. So if we think whatever we do has to do that, then we will be always disappointed. Yeah, right? for sure. So I think the thing is set yourself up with, you know, it's not a view of fatalistic reality, but saying, okay, here's what we can do. And here's also a trajectory of how long that might take and how we'll measure milestones to not lose heart and lose steam as we go forward, right? And that's the biggest challenge is keeping at that. So I'm, I'm really encouraged with what I see and, and for what it was worth in the accelerator, the ones that were working on industrial technologies or things that related to the energy industry, two powerful things there. Number one, they were developing good client bases, sometimes in the US and sometimes in Europe. And it's almost like, you know, the music industry, make it big somewhere else and then you're going to translate it back at home. And it's yeah. bizarre, but I see it. Yeah. So the guys were scaling in these places and, and it was phenomenal and creating some jobs here, but it was global work, right? So that was a really interesting lesson is don't be afraid of that. And the global work I think is going to be really important for us. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the second area was um, breaking down silos between industries. So like there's a guy where uh, he's one of the entrepreneurs I enjoy talking to so much. He's just brilliant. And he's a kind of one man band working on his company, but He's come up with a ground penetrating radar style of a technology. And what it does is it looks at um, preventing pipeline strikes. So it was originally created looking at that. It has applications though in construction, looking at bridge structuring. It has oh. applications like he was doing a, you know, I can't name the group, but it was a very large significant construction equipment manufacturer that he was running trials on, on their booms, like on, on any of the uh, construction equipment they're using to dig. And it also has implications when you look at buried landmines. So, so the idea of translation across industries with a technology going back and forth, I think is also really powerful. So those are my future things that stories, I guess, of, you know, it's not, and voila, he conquered the world because these chapters aren't yet written. Yes. <laughs> but you need to start somewhere, right? You got to get writing and you got to get the book going and the book is going. And that is so encouraging for me to see. 
And my, my joy right now is figuring out where am I going to fit in all of that? <laughs> oh, you're so right I, in the center of it. So I'm, I'm enjoying that. And I think this marriage between the little and the big and, you know, the new and the old is, um, is so critical. It's not a them and us, right? So I agree. Very wise, Heather. I knew you, this would be a great interview today. I knew it. Thanks, Catherine. It's just too much fun. And like I said, um, anytime you have to always watch out whenever you get a microphone, right? <laughs> Make sure you use it well. <laughs> yes, you did. For thank me, you. anyways. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Heather. It was wonderful spending time with you today. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed this conversation, Catherine. I look forward to watching your next ones. Like I said, I've been learning so much from your guests. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And we'll learn lots more. Everyone will share and we'll, they'll love yours too. <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Heather. Everybody, that was my dear friend, Heather Christie Burns. I know you're going to love this one. Enjoy and we'll see you next time.